I paid thousands of dollars in courses to learn what you're basically teaching on your podcast for free what you're putting out there is so valuable. So, you know, I just really want to acknowledge you and I definitely send everyone to your podcast. You were virtually one of the first mentors that I looked up to and started following. You're always one step ahead of the game. So I just wanted to give you kudos and props for that because lots of people are watching, lots of people are learning from it. Tucker and the whole TTM crew, Dan and Chris, thanks so much for your support. I love what you guys do and a huge, huge fan. Having this support's huge. So I'm grateful for that. What's up, everybody out there in listener land? This is episode 332 of the Real Deals Podcast. And as always, I am your host, Tucker Merrihue. I want to thank you guys for joining me for another show. Hey, this show actually, believe it or not, was uh, was a Facebook Live that I did last week. I've been trying to do with the interview shows live on Facebook, um, just so that uh, you guys can kind of consume the content in different ways. I know you're Many of our loyal listeners have been used to uh, listening to me in the car, at the gym, um, you know, in your earbuds, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing in podcast format for years. Uh, But I decided, you know what, let's start doing it uh, the visual format as well. And so I've been streaming a lot of the interviews that we do um, on Facebook Live also. So you might have seen me last week with my man, Jimmy Two, um, here last week as well on uh, my Facebook wall. But if you didn't, or if you did, you get a little bit more. You can listen to it again. Maybe you pull a little more, um, a few more golden nuggets out of the interview. But a little background: I've known Jimmy for probably, I don't know, maybe six years, something like that. Um, he reached out a long time ago when we first started the podcast, and uh, I helped him with a, a fairly large development deal. Um, he was in our DFA. He uh, came to. Um, our DFA event here in Portland, which was awesome. I got to meet him in person. And uh, we had a a kind of a bar night for everybody that came here. And we had a lot of good conversation and just kind of learned a lot more about each other. So we've been friends ever since. So I I asked him a while ago if he'd want to come on the show. He was a little reluctant just to kind of put himself out there at that point in time. So of course I respected that, but uh, you know, I am a squeaky wheel as well. So I circled back around, I said, hey Jimmy, you're putting videos out about your, uh, you know, social, branding or personal branding I should say so you know maybe maybe you've kind of turned a corner on this whole getting out there thing and guess what he had so he decided to come on this week's show and uh, it was a great interview he's got a great story we dive into all kinds of things just I guess progression of an entrepreneur um, especially in the space and then we talk all things marketing as well which is uber important these days so that's this week's show last week um, and we'll get into this week's show here in just a second but last week I put out kind of a let's call it a fairly provocative show And to be honest, I didn't know how it was going to be received. I I just felt like I needed to put that out there because there was a lot of headlines going around, kind of what's going on in Portland and, you know, basically making it political. You're either on this side or that side of the fence. And I wanted to put out some content that basically said it doesn't matter what side of the political fence you fall on. Here's the, the challenge and the mess, basically, that we're dealing with here in Portland. And, you know, I I don't regret putting that show out, but, you know, to be honest, uh, you know, I've been saying that a lot, but to be honest, I had a lot of people reach out to me that said that they really appreciated me putting out that show. So apparently, uh, whatever it is that I said resonated with a lot of you, um, especially a lot of local folks here, um, you know, that were afraid to say what it is that I put out there, which... You know, you really shouldn't be afraid to say the truth. And and that's what um, last week's show was. There wasn't any sort of embellishment. There wasn't any sort of slant. It was just purely the truth of what's going on here in Portland. And I wanted to give you a little update on this as well, because here's the deal, right? When you get 60, I think we're on 65 or 63 days, uh, you know, or 63 nights of protesting now here in Portland. And the feds have agreed to pull out, which, you know, has dumbed down some of it, but there's still a heavy congregation of protesting. Um, And to be fair, there's a number of them down there that are against any sort of the violence and and things that have occurred, you know, damaging buildings. So that I I can't disagree with that type of an outlook on protesting, and and I never would. But here's the problem now is that as you have that many nights of protesting, it acts as a magnet, um, not only for good people, but for bad people as well, right? People that want to cause issue uh, within a community, they wanna cause damage, they wanna cause friction. And unfortunately, that's just part of it when uh, protesting becomes such a fixture in a community for such a long time. And so, unfortunately, this past Thursday, um, one of my good friends, his mom, who's 
over 75 years old, by the way. Um, she went out to uh, pick up a couple packages off her front porch uh, in the later evening hours, and an individual that at this point appears to be kind of Portland riffraff, uh, they had to be drugged out of their mind, which, and I'm not saying the protests are exactly why this person was here, but it ties into all the problems that I talked about in last week's show. Anyway, this person asked um, my friend's mom for a ride to Portland. She politely declined because it was 10 at night and she was in, uh, you know, the burbs and was basically saying, uh, you know, uh, no, I can't give you a ride to Portland. And as she turned her back, that individual apparently rushed her and beat her almost within an inch of her life. And I, I'll be honest, I saw the hospital pick. It was the worst beating that I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them. And, um, th you know, this woman is basically defenseless. And from what they can tell at this point, they don't have any suspects in custody, but whoever it was that did it, they actually went and hid in the house afterwards. So after they went to the hospital, of course, everybody thought that somebody does a crime like that, you take off, but they went and hid in the house. And they even smoked a couple cigarettes on the back patio um, after everybody went to the hospital and cleared the scene. Um, so they do have uh, some definitive evidence on the individual. Hopefully they find them. But my point is, is that that's a terrible, one of the worst things that I've heard happen in a long time. Um, you know, a 75 year old woman going out to pick up packages and then she gets beat within an inch of her life for no reason. Um, but the point is, is that if we're going to be the epicenter for a lot of protesting, inevitably what comes with that is a lot of additional riffraff. And that's just the reality of life. That's the truth um, at this point, especially with how splintered the message is down there. And you can ask anybody that goes down there and stays through, you know, the wee evening hours, they will agree as well. Um, you know, black, white, purple, yellow, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of splintering going on. And when that happens, you get a lot of different people, a lot of different types of people. And you couple that with our homeless and drug problem that we have here, things like this unfortunately start to pop up and they start to happen. So just want to give you guys a little update on that. I hope that uh, my friend's mom ends up okay. Obviously, she's going to be mentally scarred forever, but that's the byproduct of some of this stuff, folks. And that's where it lands in our laps if we're living out in the burbs. Um, and, you know, she lives in like Oswego. So it's a very, you know, let's call it a, a, a very nice community, low crime type situation, not a place where you have to worry about going and, you know, having something like that happen. So Anyway, my heart goes out to her and uh, my friend, and I hope that she gets better, and I hope that they find the person that did it, because in my opinion, they deserve to fry. So anyway, that's the negative stuff. I'll clear that off, but I just want to give you an update. Again, this week's show is with Jimmy, my man. Um, great show, but before we get into that, I want to give you guys a big update, and this is something that um, I announced uh, maybe a couple shows ago, and I wanted to kind of let you guys know how you can utilize the service if you decide um, that you want to do it. So part of the interview with Jimmy, we were talking about you know, which marketing strategies are working best for him. Um, one of the things he mentioned is that his uh, cost per lead on PPC is like 411 bucks or something, which is crazy number. Um, but the leads are good, of course, which is why he's doing it. But he said his best producing marketing channel is cold calling. And so this year, I would say, and into next year, you know, those more aggressive type marketing channels are going to be probably the best bang for your buck if you want to supercharge your business or if you want to run your traditional marketing campaigns and then you really want to supercharge your results you layer cold calling on top and that's one of the things that we're doing and I would suggest that many of you guys do as well and so for those of you guys that are interested in doing that as I mentioned in a previous show I have partnered with um, Elliot Smith and uh, Cole Rude Johnson and uh, we've started a company called Call Magic and basically it's a cold calling and skip tracing company that we can skip trace all your lists for you we can help you pull your lists and then we can get you teed up with um, some great callers to kind of get those leads flowing directly in your business they're highly trained the lead delivery is awesome um, the system that we're working into here is awesome Right now we're taking on new customers. Uh, we'll have the website up and rolling so it's a little more seamless process here in probably about a week. Um, but for the time being, if you're interested at all, just email us, uh, info at therealdealspodcast.com, and uh, we'll connect you uh, with Elliot, and he'll kind of do um, an intake call with you to kind of figure out what it is that you need and uh, how many callers you need, what kind of data you need, um, just kind of get you pointed in the right direction. So we're really excited about it. It's called Call Magic, and uh, we really want to help a lot of investors supercharge their lead flow as we kind of head forward into the end of this year and into 2021. All right, one of the other things I want to announce is um, many of you have already downloaded it, but if you have not already, our Driving for Dollars app, make sure you go do it. Uh, you know, one of the cool things that we've done with this app is we've created a tier that's a, a $20 a month tier. 
that's unlimited skip trace or unlimited list building, excuse me. The initial tier for skip tracing is 20 bucks as well, but your unlimited list building tier is 20 bucks a month. So for those of you guys that wanna go drive and just create a massive amount of properties on this list that then you can use to either, um, you know, cold call, that'd be a great way to start marketing to this list. Direct mail, ringless voicemail, text message, whatever you wanna do. Let's say, you know, you don't want to do it yourself though, right? Well, it's pretty easy to hire drivers because that's what I do um, and then have them drive. And for 20 bucks a month, you can have an account for them where they basically build huge lists for you. Now, one of the things that we're doing with this is we're actually going to be connecting with um, Justin Silverio's Investor Hub so that you can pipe that data directly into Investor Hub. You can stack it with your other data and um, you can actually run skip tracing with just property address as well within there if you want to. Uh, it's a great seamless system. It's a great way to build the list, import the list, stack the data and start your marketing um, super quickly. So we're excited to announce this partnership that uh, we'll have up and running here very shortly with Investor Hub. But uh, if you haven't already, make sure you go download Driving for Dollars app. The initial tiers start at 20 bucks a month and we're actually gonna be bumping up the amount of skip tracing that you get in each tier, uh, probably within the next couple few weeks here. Uh, as well as we've got uh, a better data contract um, that we've been able to secure and we're going to pass that on to you guys as well. So download it. It's called the Driving for Dollars app. It's the original Driving for Dollars app and uh, it's the only one named that because we got the trademark. Other than that, uh, I want to thank all you guys that signed up for calls for our REI deal generator. Again, a, um, a two-on-one coaching program with myself and Justin Silverio. It looks like we're pretty much booked up for this next round. And so I appreciate all you guys that uh, had interest. If um, you have not already, book a call and we can chat with you. Uh, we may have one spot left in this round, but uh, most people we're talking to, we're probably going to push them to the next round at this point. And um, beyond that, if you want any other help, we highly encourage you to join our Deal Finders Academy, which is a great online mastermind group, kind of a group setting, um, a lot of really amazing people that are in there, countless people that um, you know are fixtures within the industry now that uh, have been a part of the group for years and years. So reach out to us, go to thedealfindersacademy.com and book a call and Dan will actually handle um, you know uh, the intake on that one and kind of help you get into the group if it's something that you want to do. So that's pretty much all I got for you on the intro this week. Got a great show with my man, Jimmy Two. Again, it was live on Facebook if you want to watch it there. But if not, let's get into it. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, do yourself a favor, reach out to Iron Bridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. All right, guys. Hey, we're, uh, well, welcome. This is the Real Deals Podcast. We're streaming live here this week uh, on Facebook. I've got an awesome guest for you guys, uh, which I'll intro here in just a second. Facebook's having a little bit of a, uh, we'll call it a technical glitch today uh, with uh, all of the questioning in uh, Washington, D.C. Maybe it's throwing a wrench in how Facebook operates. So anyway, we got it done. Uh, I wasn't able to, to tag my man Jimmy here, but uh, he'll be sharing it around as well. But uh, without further ado, a man that I've asked to be on the show many times. Well, not many times. I've asked you a couple times. But now I finally got him to say yes. So welcome, man. It's good to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Tucker. Uh, it's an honor. I'm, uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's been a long time coming, and uh, I know it's going to be fun. Yeah, I, I was thinking back. I was like, when was the last time we saw Jimmy? And I think it was maybe like four years ago. I think we got you to come up to Portland for one of our DFA events, and uh, you hung out with uh, myself, Dan, Chris, a bunch of other folks. But somebody posted a picture of it, actually, in the, um, in the DFA not too long ago, and there was like five or six people drinking in a bar and hanging out, and everybody's like, man, it'd be nice to – 
go back to what that felt like, right? Yeah, the good old days, it seems like, right? Time flies, man. And, uh, you know, with everything going on right now with the pandemic, that's, you know, I mean, that's definitely something that I miss doing for sure, hanging out with the guys, with the with you guys and everything. So, yeah, good well, time here. I'm with you on that one. Although we've been living a pretty normal life, to be totally honest. Um, I know certain cities are ratcheted down more than others, but we're, I mean, there's a lot of crazy shit going on in Portland right now. Don't get me wrong. But as far as like life and business, since we got a lot of construction going on, we've been coming to the office every day. We've been doing pretty normal stuff. So, you know, all in all things have been pretty normal. I mean, we moved offices. We got a new office now, um, which is nice. Uh, we're out of Portland. We're in Lake Oswego, but uh, that's about me. I want to talk about you. So I want to get into what's going on with you. Um, you know, how this year has kind of treated you so far, what's going on business wise, personal wise, all that. But I know you got a great story. So I want to give you a couple minutes just to let everybody know kind of, you know, who Jimmy is and, and kind of how you got into this world of real estate. Cause when we first kind of, you came on our radar, maybe like five or six years ago, something like that. Dan was like, there's this guy that we're talking to and he's got a lot of flashy bikes and firearms on Facebook. And I was like, let me see those pictures. I was like, damn, those are nice. And uh, and we started chatting from there. But um, anyway, without further ado, I guess, maybe give everybody a little rundown on your story and kind of how you got into uh, the world of real estate. Sure, sure. Uh, well, well, guys, my name is Jimmy too. Um, I was born and raised here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, pretty much grew up here all my life. Um, you know, was raised by a single mom. Um, and, you know, I pretty much grew up you know, I was high school dropout, you know, got into, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, knucklehead things when I was younger. And, um, you know, I, I just learned a lot of lessons along the way and uh, found myself, um, you know, just climbing back into the workforce and eventually ended up working, you know, in corporate America, you know, doing IT and, um, you know, got really burnt out, you know, from, you know, getting yelled at all day doing tech support. And, um, you know, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, thank, you know, bless her heart. She's always had an entrepreneurial spirit. And so one of the things, um, you know, we went out to lunch one day during my lunch break and she, she mentioned that um, she had heard of this real estate event and, um, you know, she signed us up for their, you know, to take the three day class. And so, um, you know, at the time, you know, I just, I said, you know what, let's, you know, what do I have to lose? Let's go check it out. Um, you know, this is back in what, 2008. And, you know, there wasn't an abundance of information as there is now. Right. So, um, you know, we decided to check it out. It's funny. I just came, I came back from lunch and, and they told me that, uh, they were going to go remote service and they pretty much laid everybody off, um, in the office or at least in my department. And so, you know, we, I ended up going to this three-day course and, you know, sure enough, it was just enough to, to get you excited, right, Tucker? I mean, you know, it's one of remember, those. Do you remember, like, what company it was? Because there's only probably, like, I don't know, two or three. It was Robert Allen. Okay. All right. Yeah. I got a Robert Allen. I went to one of those back in the day. Yeah. 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 You know, we, we all been there, right? I have the whole old school uh, Carlton Sheets course and everything. Uh, but, you know, I went to the three-day uh, seminar and, uh, you know, they kind of touched on everything. Uh, Tucker in terms of, hey, there's wholesaling, there's rehabbing. Um, naturally, it, uh, I gravitated towards rehabbing just because, you know, I'm a kind of a car geek, right? So I like taking something and restoring it. So I kind of naturally gravitated towards that. Uh, but at the time, you know, being just laid off, you know, at the time they gave me a 401k and a severance, right? I pulled out what I could from my 401k, which wasn't very much at the time. Um, you know, so I, I had to figure a way to kind of get to where I wanted to be. So I didn't know anything about wholesale. And so that really kind of stuck with me when I first, you know, when I first was introduced to it. So, um, you know, after the three days, you know, of course they tried to sell me on the $50,000, you know, we fly somebody out there to train you type deal. And I didn't have the resources at the time, but you know, I, I had the drive and the ambition and I had the hustle. So that's kind of where I started. And, um, you know, uh, like I said, there wasn't an abundance of information. So, uh, so basically, I found myself going out to a bunch of RIA groups, um, bigger pockets, and um, you know, and just networking and talking to people. And um, you know, for about I didn't get my first deal for about maybe eight to nine months after that. And I was spinning my wheels at the time because you know they trained me to go out and make a bunch of you know pretty much uh, mobile offers to you know REOs and short sales. 
you know? And so I was doing that for like eight to nine months and, um, you know, didn't get any traction until I found, you know, somebody brought me a deal that was off market direct to seller. Um, you know, and I, I don't know if you want to want me to get into that. But yeah. yeah. What, what year was that? Like when did that first, uh, cause you know, you were fishing around in the REO short sale, it's called the messy world back then, right? Of yeah. um, you know, trying to poach deals off the MLS. But when was that first uh, deal that somebody brought to you that was a direct sale deal? Direct to sale. Uh, two thousand nine. Okay. Two thousand nine. Yep. So first got introduced to real estate, got into that. Uh, just did nothing but just write offers for about eight to nine months. Um, but looking back at it, that was kind of a blessing in disguise because you know I started really understanding my market figuring out, you know, what, why this has a lower days on market than this one, why maybe this one comps out for a hundred thousand dollars more, even though it's a couple blocks away, you know, and it's, and it's because it's in a different school district, et cetera. So just learning all the different nuances of my market, you know, for those nine months really helped me, um, you know, really understand uh, my market inside out. So, um, so basically kind of how that deal broke down was somebody, um, you know, a bird dog that I uh, developed a relationship with was told me about this guy that was in trouble. So I went out to the property and met with the guy. Um, you know, the guy was he had an alcohol problem. Um, he was about to lose the property. He was in default. Um, and I think he only owed like maybe 67,000 or something like that on, on the property. And the property at the time was probably worth somewhere around maybe 550, 600. Right. So, but the place had, I mean, it, it was beat. I mean, it had foundation issues. It had a funky layout, um, needed pretty much everything. It was a full gut. Um, so I had a nice conversation with the guy and we ended up locking in the deal. I think it was 225, 215, somewhere within that range. And then, um, you know, and he already had a place to go. He already had a house out in Texas and we just needed to, a way to get there. So what I was, we were able to put the deal together and it's funny, I get a call from this really angry uh, probate attorney that he never once mentioned, you know, and uh, I kind of had, to, uh, you know, I talked to the guy, you know, you know, it's real cordial about it. And it's funny, I mean, what started off as a really hostile type of situation, I actually still work with the guy today. So we've developed nice. that relationship through the years. But long story short, um, you know, uh, at the time I, I had a, a partner, a money partner, and he says um, he didn't. You know, I was going to put it out to the market, say, hey, you know what? Don't even put it out to the market. I'll buy it. So, you know, but, I, you know, I didn't make a ton on that deal. I think it was maybe what, 10, 15 grand or something, but it was just proof of concept. And now I know that this, this formula works, right? Mm -hmm. It's a matter of rinse and repeat, right? So I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to sit here making a bunch of shitty offers to, you know, on the MLS um, to the short sales. I'm going to, how do I go direct to seller? And that's kind of where that all started. Yeah, I didn't know that I guess you really started in that direct seller world about the same time that we did, really, um, which it's, it's amazing how much it's changed. Um, I mean, the opportunities are still there that you fish out of that world. But back then, I mean, it was kind of like shooting fish in a barrel, really, um, you know, comparatively to now. But, you know, it's all relative to we were new to it back then. So it all seemed difficult right at first. Uh, but looking back, I mean. I don't know what you were doing for marketing wise kind of moving forward, but I remember we'd send out like a hundred, 200 yellow letters, which were your typical most basic t form of marketing. Then it was like high tech, right? Um, yeah. You know, some form of red font with a, you know, I want to buy, you know, your house and we get like 30 calls or something crazy per hundred, um, which it would be off the charts now for response rate. Um, what did you, what was, you, what did your adventure look like going into that? Did you start doing some marketing? Were you doing door knocking? What, what, what did that look like? Yeah. So um, at the time, you know, I had a lot of, you know, obviously I wasn't working anymore. So me and my wife were, you know, we had a bunch of time, right? So we didn't, you know, obviously we didn't have the resources, you know, to, to do a big mail campaign, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we do, we started doing some door knocking and also we, we also hand wrote a lot of our letters, right? So I remember vividly, uh, there was one time my wife and I, we pretty much locked ourselves in a room and uh, pretty much hand wrote 10,000 letters. <laughs> Like literally, man, we, we had the, the indent in our fingers, you know, the pen, <laughs> you know? And so it was crazy because I remember we were down to our last batch. I remember this vividly that day, man. I, 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 walked, I was in front of the mailbox and I, I literally looked up in the sky Tuck, and I said, you know what? God, if, if, please make something work because, you know, this is, you know, I'm down to pretty much my last, uh, 
bit of hope here, right? And so I stuck that letter in the mail. And uh, three days later, I get this call. Talk, and uh, it was this lady that inherited a property, um, you know, in a pretty nice part of town here in, in San Francisco. And, you know, she says, hey, I got a couple other other investors coming out to look at the place. Why don't you come out, take a look at it, and give me an offer. At first, Doc, I was, I was a little intimidated. I said, you know what? I mean, shit, there's going to be three, four other people there. Why are they going to pick me? Right? I almost didn't go on the appointment. And so my wife just kind of kicked my ass and just said, hey, just go on the freaking appointment. Why, do you, why are we sending these letters? So I, I picked myself up, got, the, you know, got a contract, pretty much went out to the property to look at it. Um, had a nice conversation with her, built some rapport. And, you know, I pretty much gave her an offer, right? It was a $850,000 offer. Uh, this is a Noe Valley, right? Really That's nice a lot of money back then. I mean, that was, that was high dollar. I mean, now that seems like chump change probably in where you live, but that was probably a high dollar deal back then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was scary, you know, and intimidating. And um, I didn't think, she, to be honest with you, Tucker, I didn't think she would accept it, right? I just said, hey, you know what? I, I could probably give you eight fifty for this place, right? It needs work. It's, it's dated. Um, I get a call from her the next day. And she says, hey, Jimmy, I, I, you know, I really like, I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I think I'm going to, you know, there's just something about you. I'm going to go ahead and take this off. And, you know, I, you know, I, I, I didn't have the money for the earnest money deposit even at the time, you know, it was, it was, it was really tough. And, but I was willing to do whatever it took, you know, whether I had to borrow it, line up the money to make it work. Right. So I did, we opened up escrow. I brought out, you know, I, I had a couple of guys go out there, take a look at the place. And, um, you know, one guy offered me a million dollars for it. And, you know, I pretty much, you know, that was a done deal. And it was, and it all lined up perfectly. And, um, you know, from that day forward, it, that really changed my life. And, uh, you know, I went full steam ahead. Yeah, that's cool. You know, the first deal that we poached out of uh, direct to seller marketing for here, it was high dollar. Uh, but I remember I paid four, maybe four and a quarter or something, which was like, pfft, in, in 2009, 10 in Portland, that was like for a, a, a shit product, four and a quarter was like, what, are you crazy? And I remember I had to leverage, you know, a lot of it because I didn't have a, a lot of dough back then. And um, even the like hard money lender that they still lend to us today, they're a great company, but they were like, ah, man, that's, that's risky, man. Cause our exit was going to be like 750, you know, like, woo. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we ended up selling it for 760 in like an hour to a cash buyer. And so anyway, wow. same type of thing, but that was like proof of concept all the way through. I think we ended up making around 160 grand or something like that when it all settled on that thing. And uh, it was like, whoa, we did it, you know? And uh, then we were off to the races, but it sounds like you had a similar story, which is cool. So Obviously, you made that money. I'm sure you didn't lock yourself in the room and write 10,000 more letters after that. I'm sure you probably, you know, paid for it to happen, I imagine. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever do that again, but, you know, I look back. I mean, that's, you got to earn your stripes somewhere, right? You know, it's funny. It reminds, so there was this guy, I don't think you met him when you came to town. There was this guy that worked for, for us for probably seven years. I, I did him a favor by cutting him loose when we moved here because he was basically our letter writer, letter stuffer for seven years, which is like a two month job. Right. And, uh, somehow he managed to stick around for seven years doing that. So, um, I'm like the, the, the parent pushing him out of the nest. Like it's time to go do something better with your life than just do that. So, but you know how that feels cause you did 10,000 letters there. Absolutely. So. Not easy. That's for sure. All right. So I guess that was the beginning. Um, you know, where did, where did business go from there? Uh, did you get into the rehabbing game? Did you kind of start yeah. to climb the ladder? Yep. So, you know, once, once I really got kind of a system down as far as how to find some of these deals, um, you know, the guys that, you know, I would wholesale these properties to, uh, I would, you know, I started developing a lot of relationships, right. And that's, and, you know, and so that kind of naturally gravitates towards, um, you know, because I, I personally went out and to meet with a lot of my the guys I do business with, and uh, you know these relationships were key to me. Uh, I had a couple guys take me under their wing, and um, you know, and that naturally progressed to me doing my own projects. And so, you know, they started letting me use some of their contractors, and you know, and, and it was just really cool to be able to, you know, like you said, leave the nest, kind of fly on your own, start doing my own projects. Um, but you know, you kind of go through that that rehab a roller coaster right you know you get these large sums uh of projects and then all of a sudden you're broke again for a couple months right and you're putting in your own money um 
you know, and it was just, uh, just a lot. I mean, I, I remember our first project was a disaster type year. We pretty much broke every single rule in the book, right? Bought in a really crappy area. Um, rehab took forever. Uh, basically, the, the guy, we, we, we took the lowest bid, and partially because it was the hard money lender that we were working with, um, he says, hey, you know, this guy actually goes out, he collects and does all of our draws. He's a contractor, right? And so we said, okay, that's perfect. I mean, he's going to, you know, do the draws anyway. Let's have him on board. So, you know, I, I should have known. I mean, I think it was the first month uh, he gave us about maybe three change orders. And our $30,000 bid eventually became a $90,000 project. You know, and, 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 and on top of that, it took about eight to nine months, right? And the property got broken into, I'd probably say four times, cut our copper, you know? I mean, literally, I mean, at, at one point, we actually had a buyer when we got to the buyer tuck. We, uh, my stager says, hey, I'm gonna go pick up my stuff, Jimmy. And I said, go for it. And, oh, and we staged it, right? There's a property, it's small property in the, in the hood. And uh, sure enough, they go there and they said, Jimmy, where's my stuff? <laughs> I mean, they literally took everything, Tucker, the fake apples, the fake bed. I mean, they wiped that place out. And I had, I had to make that call to the seller or I mean, to our buyer that we had in escrow and explain the situation. And he says, hey, you know what? I want to continue to move forward. Just replace the, uh, the washer and dryer, the appliances, and we'll just close escrow. But I mean, that you know was what? real. You reminded me of a story real quick. I don't want to derail you and rabbit hole too much, but we did a house in the hood back probably 2011 ish, something like that. And the morning of like the reinspect, right? So you do your remodel, your renovation, you put it to market, you get it under contract, you agree to it, you get through the appraisal, you get through the, uh, you know, inspection period, they give you the list of shit that you got to do, then you do it, then they come back and they say, okay, you did it. And then they go to closing and sign and get it done, right? Well, it was a pregnant couple. And uh, this neighborhood was like, it's come up since now a little bit, but it was like a little seedy, you know, like there was needles and stuff that, you know, we chased people out of the house and they were shooting up behind it. And anyway, I get a call like the morning of the reinspect, everything's done. So like, I'm thinking, okay, we're cruising to closing, you know, and this was the, the, the third buyer too. We'd sale failed twice for different reasons. Right. And so it was like just ridiculous. But by the time, so that morning I get a call and when I get that call, uh, they're like, Hey, uh, did you leave your garage door open? And I said, no, I didn't leave the garage door open. Uh, I was like, what are you talking about? They said, well, you might want to get over here real quick. So I went over there and lo and behold, they'd broken in and they stole the appliances out of the kitchen. They took the range and they tried to take something else. Anyway, they ruined the garage door, which was terrible. Um, but on top of that, uh, they were, we were going to have a reinspect and I was worried that they were going to basically, um, you know, be like, I don't want the house, right? People are breaking in. It's a pregnant yeah. couple. They've got a kid on the way. Like, I, I wouldn't blame them, right? You wouldn't want to be bringing a kid into a world, into a house that got broken in. Plus, you just feel unsafe, right? The house you're buying got broken into. So what am I doing, right? I'm there. I'm calling home dipstick. I'm calling Lowe's. I'm like, do you have this range, this color, this size? Like, and finally, I found one. So I'm running over there. I get it. And I'm wedging it in there. And like, I beat them by like 15 minutes. And I was like, peace, I'm out. <laughs> And the agent showed up with the couple to do the reinspect, and they never knew. And I, we got to close. But man, that morning I still remember. I was sweating like crazy. I was all irritated and pissed off. But I got to the finish line. So yeah, it, it, it's call. crazy. I yeah. mean, you know, it happens quite often, Doctor. Actually, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It happens in Portland. It used to happen a lot. They they busted a big ring of um, like thieves that were basically going around and robbing every job site. And then they had this huge warehouse. Um, where they were storing everything and then they let it sit for a while before they sold it off so that none of the like serial numbers or anything would be still be like on the hot list. And they finally found the person that owned that and ran that. And that shut down a lot of the theft in town because it was just a giant ring that was orchestrated from that warehouse. And so once that shut down, it did dial back a little bit. But one of the houses we sold last year, the house right behind us, they renovated before we finished the home we were building up front and they got all their staging ripped off and it was in a nice neighborhood. So yeah, it happens all the time, man. And that's like, we don't even put for sale signs in the yard yeah. if houses in downtown Portland, because it's just a big, if they're vacant, it's just a big target that says, Hey, well, you want some appliances? You want some staging? What do you want? Right? Yeah. Nobody's here. And so we don't put for sale signs in the yard for that reason. Yeah. For sure. So, so anyway, sorry, I, I derailed you. But um, anyway, you, they ripped you off. And I assume you got that to closing though, right? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, it, it took a lot longer than than we initially planned, but um, you know, thank God, you know, we 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 learned a lot of that stuff in the beginning stages, you know, and so uh, we didn't lose any more money after that. Needless That's to say, did you make money on that deal? No, I think we lost about what twenty three, twenty five thousand bucks on that one. Okay. It was definitely school of hard knocks for sure. Well, that's an, that's an honest answer from a true investor because we've all lost uh, money or had to eat, you know what, on a deal um, every now and again. It's just kind of the way it works. If you're not, you're not really doing enough deals probably um, or you're yeah. just being super conservative. But so I guess from there, did you just kind of, you got a little more experience, you yeah. hired the right people, just kept building the machine? Yeah, for the most part. And, uh, you know, I got to a point after where I think we were maybe 2012, 2013, I just got really burnt out, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, at the time, you know, we were just kind of managing projects and, you know, I started losing track of, you know, things that really mattered to me most, you know, family. And, um, you know, I just had to really reevaluate and kind of just look at the situation and say, okay, how do I, you know, how do I build this business in a way that, you know, fits my the lifestyle, I, um, you know, my desired lifestyle, you know, but at, but at the same time, be able to run the machine. And so, um, you know, Which I think it's important, by the way, I think a lot of people don't take a step back and do that. So yeah. I'm glad to hear you did. Yeah. And, you know, I think at the time, Tucker was, uh, we were, my wife and I were also, we had our own, uh, RIA group that we were running and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So we ran it for about what, five years and, you know, during that time I, I would meet a lot of guys that were in the business as well. Um, that would come up to me and just say, hey, Jamie, how do you find, you know, these opportunities, right? And so I kind of looked at it and said, okay, well, you know what, maybe I'll start sourcing some of these properties, you know, some of these projects out to some of these guys again, right? And so naturally by doing that, Tucker, I mean, it, it, it relieved a lot more stress from, from my plate. And, um, you know, also it allowed us to be a little bit more, uh, you know, to kind of cherry pick some of the deals that we actually wanted to do. Um, so that's been kind of pretty much the business model ever since, you know, is, you know, we're, we're taking on projects, but we're also doing, you know, we're also sourcing to other guys in the area. Um, and so that natural, I guess, progression into kind of what we're doing now as well, um, has been the model ever since. Gotcha. So fast forward to now, mm -hmm. what are the, the types of projects that I guess fit within the box of what you're trying to do? Um, and also, you know, the lifestyle that you're trying to create. Sure. Well, well, ever since I became a dad, uh, Tucker, what, he's two and a half years old now to my son. Um, I, I finally realized that, you know, I'm, I don't want to be the janitor, the accountant and the, you know, pretty much, I don't want to wear all these hats anymore. You know? So, I mean, I, I know we, you know, we've been successful, you know, doing it with a one, two man show model, you know, for so many years, but it, it finally came, after becoming a father, I, I realized that I couldn't stay up to like two, three in the morning anymore doing property analysis. So I really focused on actually scaling the business and building an actual business versus, you know, kind of being in it every day. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I have a, a really great team now, you know, that, that I could, you know, that I could rely and trust to kind of run the day-to-day -day operations on the uh, single family side um and you know it's kind of freeing up a little bit more of my time right to be able to focus on some of these bigger uh projects and you know development and then fill lots of stuff that you know that that, that i actually want to get into and that i love doing yeah. so then you've got a a direct to seller marketing machine that the team basically executes on on kind of a yep. daily basis correct what um what kind of marketing channels are you utilizing these days? Because it I imagine it's you know your area is super competitive, right? Uh, just like many. So I mean, what's what's working? What's what are you doubling down on these days, or what's kind of your bread and butter down there? Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned direct mail, Tucker, because I think for a good what five year span there, um, you know, like you said, man, it was really easy. We just sent out these yellow letters, and you know, we see you know maybe knock out a couple deals a month and be be happy, right? Uh, but you know, especially in my market now, it's ultra competitive, right? And, um, you know, you're talking about people from Silicon Valley, you know, really smart people. And, um, you know, for us, we have to be very strategic in terms of how we market. And, and so for us, we, you know, we're, we're doing several things right now. So I have my own cold calling uh, team, right? So I, we built a small call center. Um, we also do RBM, SMS, PPC. 
and uh, you know direct mail, but more strategic now nowadays than we were doing. Well, I think before we were just shotgunning everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're a lot more strategic with who we mail and and uh, market to. Gotcha. So you, I mean, you kind of got the gamut going there, really. I mean, you're doing quite a bit of stuff. What um. I mean, cold calling is kind of a new phenomenon, right? Like relative to this space, you know, let's call it the last couple of years. Is that, um, I mean, which one has been the most consistent lead flow for you, let's say post pandemic? Well, not post pandemic. Let's say the, the last few months, right? Because the, the, there was a couple months in there that got pretty messy. And I don't really know that we can kind of extract much from that other than it was messy. But like right now, what's kind of, I guess, pulls the best? What's the bang, best bang for the buck, best ROI on your marketing dollars? Uh, it's funny, we were looking at that yesterday, and I think right now we are, I guess the best bang for our buck is probably from, probably telemarketing, right? So it's the, it's the cold call, yes, mouse RVM, uh, but in terms of quality, uh, I really like our PPC numbers as well. Okay. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. It's real expensive though, but you know, it, it, it generates really good leads. What, um, just out of curiosity, what do you got to pay per click down there approximately? I mean, I imagine. Well, uh, cost per lead is about $401. Okay, 401 Okay, for a filled out form. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's PPC is not cheap. That's for sure. Um, but, you know, of course, direct mail is not either, um, especially if you're sending a lot of it. Well, are you just sending to like, um, let's call it more niche type properties, more niche lists versus yeah. like, let's just say an absentee list for an entire zip code, something like that? Correct. So now, I mean, since our focus is, you know, a little bit more uh, the infill lots and that type of thing, uh, we're, we're spending a little bit more money on the, on the pieces, on producing quality pieces versus sending out these, uh, you know, 40 cent um, uh, postcards like we were. Mm -hmm. So we're spending a little bit more money on, you know, nicer pieces, but, you know, that's because, you know, they're, they have their, these deals have higher potential. And so right now we're putting a campaign together, you know, to go after, um, you know, specific lots that have specific zoning types, mm -hmm. uh, at certain building parameters. Um, and we're sending mail. We're also calling these folks and, um, you know, we're, we're hitting them in different angles, basically. Yeah. And I mean, that's one of the things that we do too, which has actually been really successful. Um, you know, we've been toying with something lately with, um, like we moved our office, I told you, to just um, Lake Oswego here, as opposed to we were in kind of Southwest Portland before, and we were marketing to Southwest Portland, Southeast Portland, um, Lake Oswego, West. We had a it was a pretty wide net, um, which you know for certain operations you need that much data and you need that wide of a net in order to kind of fill it with leads and deals. For us, we kind of wanted to you know I wanted to do addition by subtraction for the rest of this year, and we're just marketing in a very very narrow area, which is Lake Oswego. But one of the things that we've done for years is kind of higher quality marketing pieces. Um, and that's been kind of our niche marketing. Um, and we've made a ton of money uh, with that strategy, kind of a, a very specific list. Usually like you're talking about infill stuff, tear down stuff, um, you know, that we can buy, tear down, build new. And those usually have big margins attached to them. So it justifies the additional cost and investment. Um, but now one thing we've noticed is that by niching down and we've got this office here that you can't see in front of us but we've got it's basically right on the boulevard in downtown lake oswego we've got uh the guy that bought the building is a buddy of mine so he let me put signage up everywhere so people can see the signs from any direction that they go and we've built a really good brand here in lake oswego so we've been able to get away lately with a cheaper mailing piece um that reinforces a brand that we've built um, and so we've been able to kind of go more shotgun with that. And then we do, of course, our specialty pieces as well. But it's, it's really just about getting people's attention, keeping their attention and, and intriguing them enough to call you. And if, if you build a brand in an area long enough, they'll call no matter what. But if you're trying to build that presence, you can get there a lot quicker with that specialty mail piece versus, like you said, your 40 cent typical yellow postcard or something like that. Um, and right. people have more confidence in it too, a lot of times, you know? Correct. Yep. Yeah, I, I remember, I think we were going unbranded for a really long time. And, uh, you know, we, we, we were split testing in certain areas and, you know, branded versus unbranded. And we noticed that in higher end markets or at least certain areas, uh, the branded stuff works better uh, versus unbranded. So, you know, through testing, we've kind of come up with a formula as far as where we're going to be marketing, yeah. and sending mail to these days. Do you have... Um... Like in terms of sequence, because sequence is big for us, um, how we hit people, we usually lead with direct mail, like that's our first, you know, touch point. And then we kind of, you know, we have multiple touch points beyond that. 
where do you guys, are you cold calling just indefinitely through data or are you placing that cold call at a specific point in your marketing sequence? Uh, it depends on, on the, on the list type. So, you know, let's say if it's just a, a high equity list, uh, you know, just, just a bunch of numbers, then, you know, we're just having our guys plow through those. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are also lists that require, you know, that are maybe a little bit more time sensitive, like pre foreclosure, probates, et cetera. Uh, so there are timestamps on these things, you know, so, you know, for those, you know, we, uh, we have guys that, you know, fill, you know, that go through that list uh, sooner than others. Right. So, yeah. So we kind of split them up depending on what they are. Gotcha. And then obviously, you know, Ringo's voicemail is hard to beat because it's so damn cheap. Right. Yep. Um, and, uh, and then text how here people are very sensitive about their text inboxes. It seems like, so we have to be careful with the branded approach on texting because we don't want to permanently alienate ourselves from a potential purchase. Um, what do you guys find there? Are people as sensitive or are they kind of used to getting maybe strangers in their text um, inboxes down there? Well, our approach is a little bit different though, because when we're reaching out to people, it's more, it more has more of a, a follow-up type of feel to it. Okay. Um, and you know, if it's a mistake, Hey, you know, by the way, here's kind of what we do. Um, if you happen to know anybody that's looking to sell, please let us know. So, I mean, I, I, that kind of helps a little bit, you know, um, but you know, we, we do get, you know, the occasional sensitive person as well. And we, we have a system where we kind of just, um, uh, extract those people, uh, you know, in the process. Yeah. Suppress them, get them off the list. ASAP. Yeah. You don't bother. Yeah. Anymore. yeah. Yeah, it was, it was texting always just, it kind of, um, it surprised me because it's kind of like, you know, back in the day email, like now everybody gets spam email all the time and they're just like, delete, delete, delete. But like, I don't know if you remember, I remember my mom first got an email account and she was like, would go through everyone because everyone was so important, right? And like some people are still that way about their texts, you know, even though, I mean, I probably got three today from Sprint about some offer, right? Yep. But, and they just get so they're, they're so protective of their their inbox. So yeah. you know, the text is a funny thing, man. It this whole direct seller thing, like it's really like you get to uh, to peek in the psyche of people, you know, and like how they respond to stuff. And it's it's so funny to see how different people respond differently. Absolutely, yeah. You, you get some weirdos out there, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. We had we had one guy. I think the first uh, direct mail campaign we ever did, and I still have the message. And he was like, "I'm gonna beat you to death with something." And I was like, "Jesus, man! Like, I just sent you a yellow letter." Like, <laughs> yeah. I had a guy actually. He uh, he called he, because we have different tracking numbers, and I think the guy literally called every every 15 minutes, and his message was just him heavy breathing. We've had one of those. <laughs> yeah, one of those. I mean, this guy literally for every 15 minutes, I mean, into the night, everything, it was, it was just odd, man. But yeah, I'm sure yeah. you have some nice, some funny stories. Oh some yeah, stories. we've got a bunch. We actually, uh, uh, our mutual friend, Jason from down there, Mr. Boozy, he, uh, he sent me a message that he got a few years ago that uh, he's had some lovely ones too. So uh, and we're all, none of us are immune. We all get them to some extent, you know, Absolutely. But, uh, but we haven't got as many lately. I think I, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, actually. I feel like with all of like the just nastiness online and everything that's gone on the last few months, like I feel like everybody's getting their shit out on like, you know, directed towards somebody else. And then they get our direct mail piece. And they're like, I'm not interested in selling. Please take me off the list. Right. Versus right. like, don't ever mail me again. Like, so right. we haven't gotten a ton lately, which, it's kind of nice actually, but, um, it's interesting to see the progression of maybe why that is. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we used to be the ones taking the calls back then, you know, so yeah. I, I don't, not very much anymore, but, um, you know, I remember, you know, we listening to every single call and listening to every single message. And, uh, I'm pretty sure we have a library somewhere of, uh, <laughs> some really cool, funny messages. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got a big library. Send them over. I'd love to hear yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I want to move it on here a little bit. What, um, the projects, the bigger ones that you're taking on right now. I've seen some stuff that you got, you know, you posted online, but what are they, man? What are these big things? Cause I saw one, you've got like a 16 to 40 unit um, yeah. you know, subdivision, something like that. Yep. Maybe break that down a little bit. I'm curious what you got going on there. Sure. Sure. So uh, our focus right now is going after underutilized lots, right? So, you know, for um, infill development, um, you know, I'm doing both commercial and um, residential. Right, so we're working on right one right now. It's a eight-acre parcel, right? So it's four two-acres lots, and um, 
you know, it's zoned rural residential, which it's, it's basically breaks down to, according to their building code, it's a uh, half an acre per property. So out the box, we could probably split this thing up into 16 and build 16 homes. Um, the, the, as we were, you know, cause Temecula, this is a little bit new of a newer market for us. So, you know, talking to a couple of civil engineers in the area, uh, we, we, we learned that we could actually get do what's called a zoning amendment, right? And it happens every five years. And so they said, you know, it's probably going to timeline wise, instead of, you know, 15 to 16 months, it's probably going to take you maybe closer to three years. But after you do that, it's going to allow us to be able to cut those things up into maybe about 38, we thought it was going to be 40 at first. But after, uh, he, you know, after we got the um, feasibility done, it looks like we're closer to 38, somewhere within that range. Um, you know, so right now we're currently going through a pre-app and we're waiting for the report, get some feedback um, to really decide which direction we're headed. Um, you know, but that's, you know, and but we noticed that Lennard's building, you know, they built a nice subdivision right in front of us and they actually built out two uh, on each side as well. So there's definitely activity in the area. Um, Would you sell that thing out, you think? Would you get it entitled and then, you know, go ring, 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 Lennar, hey, you want to buy something? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's the game plan. It's just do or do we want to wait three years and get the amendment, um, you know, or do we want to, you know, get this thing through entitlements and just be done with it in 15 months, right? So, you know, that's that's kind of where we're at and we're just waiting to get the, uh, the, the report back, uh, you know, and you just kind of go from there. What do you think the value difference? Because this is the game that all developers play, right? Density, oh. like how dense can we redevelop something? What do you think the the value difference is on that land uh, from 16 lots to let's say 38? Now, obviously, there's a lot more infrastructure that has to be put in for 38 lots, so it's not like you just get you know that much more profit per lot. But have you guys done kind of a best case scenario on both sides to see if it's worth kind of taking it all the way through to that? I imagine you have, but. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I actually had this conversation uh, with my business partner yesterday. And because we, we talked to a few people or some agents out there in the area that specialize in, in land and, and uh, they work with a lot of uh, developers in the area. And so I wanted to get their feedback on kind of what raw lots are selling for versus uh, finished lots. And just to get a, somewhat of an idea. Um, so we we're looking at some of the properties that, that sold around the corner that Lenar built. And those were somewhere around 850 to 900. Um, so we're thinking that, you know, uh, at least according to our findings, you know, if we go through entitlements, we could probably get, you know, we could probably sell these things for about 200 a pop. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, if, but if we were to take it all the way and maybe do it into 38, you know, your lots are going to be a lot smaller. Um, and actually talking to a few, uh, developers in that area, um, they're thinking that, you know, the 16 lot plan out the box is actually a better play just because, you get much bigger, nicer product. Um, and there's a slight, you know, there's some elevation there. You get, there's some, uh, some amazing views as well. Mm -hmm. So kind of leaning in that direction. We're going to, and on top of that, we're going to be able to exit a lot sooner as well. Oh yeah. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're, we're what we're looking at, but you know, I want to wait to get the, the final report. Uh, yeah. I ask cause it's, it's always the, the game, right? Do you go with like a, a slightly less dense, higher price point, nicer product, or do you go with something that's denser, that's maybe a, a slightly lower price point that has more, maybe a little bit bigger buyer pool, but then you've got more infrastructure that you've got to put in. And then of course you've got time as well. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. Development game. It's a fun game, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the cool thing about it though, Tucker is, you know, especially in a highly competitive market, you know, that we're in, we, we kind of have to go out and create an opportunity, right? So at one point, what we were doing was we would go to some of these neighborhoods that have really, you know, high-end product, and I'll just look for the smallest property in the area, one that we could add square footage, um, you know, get the plans, sell it with the with the plans to a to a spec builder, right? Um, that was one, you know. So we've kind of adjusted our strategy as well to kind of go after, you know, more of these subdivision type of opportunities, you know, bigger lot sizes. I'm um, also going after, you know, we're also looking at stuff based off of zoning as well. So we could, maybe we could do some commercial mixed use type product. Um, so, you know, it's really exciting. And, and, and in some cases, you know, you're not trying to convince somebody to buy their property or their lot at 60 cents on the dollar. I mean, you could actually almost pay full retail for the lot, knowing that the value is going to be, you know, in the entitlements and what you could build there afterwards.
Yeah, for sure. It's just a delayed pay model, right? I mean, that's basically what it is and knowing kind of how to get through all that and, you know, having a team of people that can kind of help you along the way. That, that's really what that game is, which, yeah. which is cool. I mean, we do, for us, a lot of it is buying it at, you know, we can buy a house for the house value, tear the house down, build something new and then sell it for exponentially more. Right. But we're yeah. still able to buy the house for approximately what that house is worth, you know, and that's, um, you know, that's a cool game that we get to play for just simpler, you know, one down, one up stuff. But cool. yeah, in the longer term game, what, um, what are you guys using for, um, you know, your financing model on stuff like that? Just out of curiosity, private money, or are you doing kind of a bridge of bank and private? Yeah. So one of the things that's really helped me um, with this whole COVID stuff, Doctor, is um, I actually kind of locked myself in a room and just made a bunch of calls, right? Because I remember in 2009, you know, I was buying a ton of, you know, I was buying stuff at a really steep discount, right? So I was buying properties in Oakland that were, you know, 80, 90,000 bucks that are worth five, six, 700,000 now, right? And so I said, hey, you know, this time around, you know, I, I wanna position myself to be able to capitalize on more opportunity. And so we went out and raised uh, a lot more capital to be able to add to the war chest, to be able to make these offers. But uh, I, I like to structure my deals as well, with, especially with the development stuff, Tucker, to where, um, you know, I'll give them something closer to their asking price if they give me my terms. Mm -hmm. So meaning if I structure the lot, let's say, you know, if they could give me 15, 16 months to get the entitlement, you know, that's going to have, that's going to save me from having to put out the money, pay interest, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I try to, you know, get as, as long of a due diligence process as I can to allow me to be able to get the entitlement work done. Um, aha, aha. Yeah, there's yeah. the there's a the little trick on that, right? You give yeah. them uh, give them a little bit of earnest money or something non refundable. Let them hold the uh, you know give you the contract time to get all that stuff done. Then go find the money, pop it, and then uh, turn around. You're ready to go. So absolutely, yeah, yeah. So. That's a good way. That's a good way to do it. We've done that on on many partitions as well. Not you know we haven't done anything 16 lot or bigger. Obviously. Um, just doesn't fit within our model most of the time. But yeah, that's how you kind of, you basically are using their money to complete the development for the most part. And then you just go out and fund it once it's ready to go. Yeah. I mean, why pay the interest if you don't have to, right? So, yeah. well, and to be honest, that's what buries a lot of developers is they just, they play, they pay that or play that delayed pay game and they just get buried in the entitlement process. And then, you know, they end up with cash flow issues because they're carrying this loan on this dead dirt, right? That they've got to ultimately turn into more and, and they do eventually but yeah that's the better way to do it so that's, that's what i was digging for i got it out of you so. <laughs> um, all right well hey we're almost up uh here on an hour but uh before we wrap it up uh one other topic that i wanted to bring up real quick is um obviously you've been doing some some personal brand work lately it looks like um i'm kind of curious you know are you venturing out i mean i got you to come on the podcast so you know now you're you're moving out of uh you know your comfort zone or just you know doing other things uh what's up with that are you looking to to build that and and keep that moving in kind of a, a direction where you kind of you know build some more following or maybe start something um what's going on with that um you, you know me tucker i've always been very you know private you know just kind of put my head down just do the work but um, you know, I just realized that, you know, just being able to help and provide, you know, and have somewhat of a platform, you know, why not use it to be able to help and, you know, help and inspire and give back to people. I know that when I first got started in the business sector, uh, you know, I'd go to some of these meetings and, you know, some of these more established guys wouldn't give me the time of the day, right? Saw me as competition or whatnot and recorded information. But I always promised myself that when I had, you know, when I gained some level of success, I want to be able to, um, you know, to give back and help somebody, you know, that, because I was in their shoes not too long ago, you know? Um, so where it's going to go, I'm not sure yet, Tuck, but you know, I, I do want to be able to uh, provide as much value and help as many people as I can. You know, I, don't, I don't have any formal coaching program or anything like that. I never wanted to be a guru or anything. I was just wondering if you're going to start a podcast. That's what I'm getting at more than anything. You know? Oh, no, no. I don't, you know, that's all you, Tuck. Uh, that's, oh, I you mean, know? there's plenty of room for everybody else. I'm just curious. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, no, 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 no really podcast, podcast but uh, I, I've been thinking about doing the uh, uh, more of maybe a, a virtual meetup type of deal locally, um, you know, and so that's that's something that that's in the works now. Right on. Yeah, I didn't know you ran a RIA for so long um, before yeah. all this. So I guess, you know, you know what you're doing. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris saw one of your videos. He's like, did you see Jimmy's car? And I was like, no. What? He's like, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, one of my uh, – I, I have a lot of hobbies, man. Yeah, no, I know, I know. Well, hey, man, yeah, we're buttoning up on an hour here, and uh, I got stuff to do. I'm sure you do too, but I appreciate you saying yes and coming on and kind of chatting with me, and obviously everybody that's watching here, and we'll hear on the uh, podcast version when we put it out later today or tomorrow. But um, it's good to hear things are cruising for you, man. Um, you know, it's been kind of a bumpy year for everybody, so it sounds like everything's going good right now, and you know, it's always good to hear. Absolutely, man, and and and. and- and really, Tucker, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been an honor. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I was a big fan of the, pod, the podcast growing up, you know, and uh, listening to it. You know, I was out there driving for dollars. and You know, it's, it's always kind of kept me going. You know, it's, you know, so being, being on this podcast, is, it's been a really cool experience. And uh, thank you so much for being a great leader, Tucker. I think you really helped me with that one big deal that we, that we did, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll, I'm wait, I'm waiting for my Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but you've been a really big inspiration for me, man. And you know, I just wanted to genuinely say thank you so much for for everything you've done for me. Well, I appreciate it, man. It's been even cooler for me to have connected with a lot of people along the way. And now I was just thinking about this yesterday. There's a lot of people that you know, earlier on in their careers, we kind of connected. And now, you know, a lot of them are, are well-known fixtures in this industry all across the country. And it, it's just cool to be connected with them on a friendship level and having, you know, played some minor part, you know, as they came up, maybe they listened to me or just we knew each other, whatever, you know. Um, so it's, it's been a cool thing. Obviously, you're one of those guys. So anyway, man, I, I appreciate you coming on here today and kind of divulging some information. And uh, as always, it's always good to catch up, man. Absolutely, man. Tell the guys I said hi, and uh, hopefully I'll make it up that way, and I'll see you guys soon, huh? Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, we'll say peace, Jimmy. See you, bud. All right. Thanks, Doc. I'll talk to you soon, brother.